Hi. Um, good to be here at Brainwash Festival and good to see you here. Um, before, because I'm going to interview Anat Singh, uh, anthropologist, um, professor at uh, the University of California in Santa Cruz, and author of, uh, amongst others, this book, uh, The Mushroom at the End of the World, um, on the possibility of life in the capitalist ruins. I think this is a very important book. I think we need this book. But then, of course, the question is, so, why, why the Machutake mushroom? Why is this an important figure to explore a story that she is telling us? And um, I'm very happy that um, that Anna Ching is, he Ching is here. In a way, I am now waiting for her to, I don't know, to appear on. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, uh, good to see you. I must say, it's a bit strange that. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you now. You're looking at me. Um, then the audience is over there. You're, you're also projected behind. So um, all these perspectives um, are a bit, um, I don't know, it gets, uh, I have to get used to it. <laughs> um, so um, very good to, to, to have you here. And first of all, I would like to um, address the fact that you are here now, um, not in the flesh, um, but of course, uh, in the mind, um, digitally. Um, and I'm wondering, is this uh, something that, um, this is something that we're of course doing a lot now, nowadays. We, all of us, we are being digitally present uh, anywhere around the globe. But when I was preparing for this interview, I um, was reminded of the introduction to a book um, by um, a philosopher who's also interested in the Anthropocene, Alexis Shotwell. Um, and she, she, in the introduction, she, she explains to us, the readers, how she was flying home from a conference, um, a conference on the Anthropocene, and in the um, lavatory of the flight, washing her hands in philosophy, washing her hands clean in philosophy soap. Uh, and of course, the question is, so what am I doing here? Is this okay that I went to the conference? Uh, and I'm explaining this because this was one of your conferences um, yeah, on arts of living on a damaged planet. And now I'm wondering, would you, yeah, would you have flown here? How to think about this, relate the personal to the global? First, thanks very much for having me as part of the Brainwash mm -hmm. Festival. And it's my first time, too, to imagine being projected in two different places in the same hall. So it's quite disorienting <laughs> from my perspective as well. And I have to kind of bring myself around to thinking about what that means. But let me try and address your question, because, of course, the reason we're here virtually has everything to do with that assumption of rapid travel uh, around the world that we've just so naturalized. If the pandemic did anything for me, it's in part made me look twice about uh, should we be flying around the world all the time at the drop of a hat. Uh, that here in California, uh, the first time I heard that my students were taking spring break vacations in New Zealand, and I thought, okay, this is a different world where people are zipping around at the drop of a hat. And um, that, of course, has everything itself to do with the pandemic. I want to recommend uh, historian Andrew Liu has written a little essay about how the coronavirus first uh, moved out of China into Europe, and it's on the supply chain for um car parts and the car parts executives that were flying back and forth every day to Shanghai and Wuhan uh, carried that virus to Europe. And uh, if you want to find that essay, just look up Andrew Liu, L-I-U, Feral Atlas. And I think you'll find it, 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 to me, a very convincing argument that the kinds of taken for granted everyday travel uh, that we've become a part of are themselves uh, bringing us into conditions of uh, epidemics all around the world, and not just for humans also, too, but for plants and animals um, besides us. So I think there's a reason to... Um, excuse me. <laughs> um, there's a reason to not... Uh, maybe to think about uh, denaturalizing 
all of that zooming around. I know mean, that's the wrong word, but since we're on a technology also called Zoom, but that, that a traipsing around that we do all the time without thinking about it. And perhaps to use some of this technology, even going into the future, to, uh, to uh, cut back on some of the ways that we send goods around the world, we send ourselves around the world, that perhaps uh, some of the virtues of staying in place might uh, have come to our attention over the last two years. Yeah. Yes, I think indeed very much so. So um, through um, through COVID, it, it was, um, at least in the beginning, um, it was experienced, I think, for most of us as um, a, a possibly a reset. So we might start to act and behave differently. Although I must say that I am not really sure about that anymore. Just like the blockage in the Suez Canal, the, ca the tanker, I don't know, it seems to tell us something about these global supply chain chains um, um, and that we might not want to be so very dependent. And also, so the publication, so I have the English translation or the, so, sorry, the publication of your, your I think it's the first edition here. Um, but then um, the, the Dutch uh, translation um, is is going to be published in a few weeks. Um, mind you, one of the reasons for it not being published yet is not that, um, that there is no printing paper, but that is a big problem um, nowadays for the publishing industry because um, the publisher here, she already had the supply of paper already there. So, but I just wanted to mention it anyway because it seems to be a kind of glitch that we can listen to or pay attention to. Um, but, but are we really so... Um, are we putting our hopes too much up for these resets, for um, these shocks, and then nothing much happens? There's a lot uh, condensed in that question. So let me uh, break it apart and first discuss the commodity chains, which I think are a, a constitutive contradiction in the capitalist world system that we're a part of. On the one hand, they try to make us assume that the whole world has been uh, transformed into resources for capitalist uh, accumulation. Everything in the world, all forests in the world, are, should be vulnerable for the paper market, for example. On the other hand, because of the transport involved, of all the logistics involved. It's in fact a quite vulnerable set of connections that, you know, allows a forest in Myanmar, for example, to become paper for a European publisher. Uh, that that set of connections, which depends on so many historical, cultural, socioeconomic factors, is extremely vulnerable. So we put ourselves in a place where a single ship in the Suez Canal can block supply chains all around the world. Uh, so there's that, that important contradiction uh, that we're living with here, and that, as you said, could be a wake-up call. So this is the other part of your question of can we respond to these uh, kinds of crises? And of course, I'm sure everyone in the audience knows that uh, for the last several hundred years, it's capitalist entrepreneurs that best know how to take advantage of crises, that every crisis, you know, as folks like Naomi Klein have pointed out, have been the opportunity for more privatization, for more uh, uh, bringing uh, the world's resources into projects of accumulation and out of the hands of humans and non-humans who might be using them for other things. So yeah. we're always... Uh, needing to keep that in mind when these crises happen. And the, the other is that uh, we have to fight against a pervasive and uh, harmful kind of common sense that wants to return everything to business as usual, that wants to address the pandemic uh, only by setting up better safeguards in ourselves, for example, through vaccinations, which are great. I'm all for vaccinations, but they're not enough if we don't change the kinds of uh, business habits and personal habits that 
uh, we are contributing to. So yeah. uh, we're all, we have to struggle against these kinds of frameworks that tell us, for example, that growth is always a good thing, that more travel is always a good thing, uh, that these don't always make sense. And yet they're reinforced over and over again in our in our lives. Yeah. And I feel like this, in a way, this question brings us to the um, to the heart of you, what your book is about. I think precarity, so shared shared precarity, because it seems that in in moments, yeah, like like when COVID hit, when a tanker hit, we very much felt this vulnerability, each of us individually, but also as I don't know, as uh, societies or as a species even. And sometimes I feel like we really want to, to put that precarity back in the box or, or not want to feel it. And like there's all these systems in place to make sure that we don't stay, as Donna Haraway would say, stay with the trouble, stay with that pain or precarity or yeah, um, fear perhaps also. Um, so is this, is this what, we are f f what we should be fighting against um, to move away from that feeling of precariousness? No, I, precariousness is a condition that we're all going to live in. So I think our, we can't do anything except navigate and live as well as possible uh, within our shared precarity. But there are some ways of doing it that are better than others. And the single worst way is to pretend that we just don't know that it exists and that the conditions of our political economy, as usual, are creating the forms of our precarity. I was in an Indonesian language class recently where the discussion was, uh, you know, why are there environmental problems? And the thing that, because I'm not a native Indonesian speaker, that really caught me is the answer one of the students gave was, uh, there's so many environmental problems because we haven't progressed enough. <laughs> and to me, that progress that we're so quick, it seems so natural to, uh, to hold on to, that the assumption of that progress is the problem that causes all of the environmental disasters around us. That rather than the solution, we need to think of the kind of blinders of, of expectations of progress as the problem that we're uh, arguing against. Uh, so only by sort of breaking those blinders, I think of progress narratives as a kind of set of um, narrative blinders, you could call it, that has us look at a pinpoint possibility as the only thing that matters because it's been, it's been legitimized as the future. And everything that's going on around us, and again, back to precarity, all of the many kinds of lives, human and non-human, uh, you know, well-off and impoverished, um, all these things disappear completely in the focus on that singular imagined future. Yeah. So um, perhaps, so the interesting thing I think in your book is that, so it's the mushroom uh, at the end of the world and my uh, before I read it, I thought this is going to be a book about the atomic bomb. <laughs> and perhaps in a way it is a book about the atomic bomb. It is a book about the end of the world in a grand sense, like an apocalypse. But then, yeah, so I'm wondering, isn't, so, so you don't mention the apocalypse really or the end of the world, but is this a way to, I don't know, whittle it down or make it a less, uh, yeah, an an ending of a world, but not from the perspective of, 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 of a grand narrative of progress of a bang, but then smaller ends of the world. Is that, um, yeah, is that, is that why? <laughs> um. Probably many of the people in the audience have heard this term Anthropocene that a lot of folks are using these days to refer to a time of environmental crisis, a time when human infrastructures have caused a lot of harm uh, perhaps kinds of global warming that will be hard to live within. Um, many in my attempts to think about uh, how to approach and live within the Anthropocene, many uh, of my colleagues have tried to push me to come up with a singular chronology, a timeline that shows how did we get into such trouble? 
why are we in such hot water? And my answer is always that there isn't a singular timeline, that there's multiple timelines that converge in multiple Anthropocene kinds of problems, and that we need to understand that conjuncture across all of these timelines as, um, as the problems that we're stuck in rather than a singular march to a great apocalypse. Uh, mushrooms have been very helpful for me to think with in terms of trying to imagine a set of temporalities that's not just the singular narrative march, but instead a set of intertwined and patchy kinds of time that we're caught up in. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, um, I would like to discuss them. So, so these stories you tell indeed with the mushrooms, because I think, yeah, it's in, in the beginning that you write. Um, so the Matsutake's willingness, um, they, are, they are important to think with because of the Matsutake's willingness to emerge in blasted landscapes. And this allows us to explore the ruin that has become our collective home. So you are using these um, mushrooms in a way or putting them to, to use to tell stories with. But I'm wondering, so I have a twofold question again, but now explicitly. So one, why the Matsutake? And then two, why the storytelling? So because, of course, you're an academic, but why, why use mushrooms to tell stories? Why, why tell stories anyway as an academic? Sure. I mean, uh, thank you for the question. And let me start by just telling a little bit about the kind of mushroom. I won't get to Matsutake as a particular mushroom yet, but it's a kind of mushroom that where its body, uh, the fungal body, uh, grows together with the roots of trees. So the technical term for that is mycorrhizal. And this kind of joint growth between trees and mushrooms. The roots of trees become anchors, if you would, uh, for the uh, fungus to weave around them and to kind of penetrate between the cells. Uh, in fact, the trees create special roots for the mushrooms. If they can't find any of them, those roots will just retract and, and wither. Um, so the roots need this association with the fungi, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm using the American pronunciation, but you're just going to have to put up with that. Uh, and, uh, so the roots and the fungi need each other, and they nourish each other, that the fungi are getting their carbohydrate meals from the trees, and the trees are getting water and nutrients from the fungi. And uh, meanwhile, the fungi are weaving a great web through the forest floor uh, underneath the soil. Uh, some people have talked about the wood wide web to make it a WWW kind of image of how uh, fungi in the soil of a forest uh, connect with varied trees, even trees of different kinds. Uh, uh, so, uh, and that they are a kind of web of interconnection between soils and roots and fungi and even some kinds of plants uh, that grow only with uh, uh, supported by these fungi. Uh, so there's a whole kind of web of life uh, being caused, being brought into being by this particular kind of fungus. I think that's really good to think with. Uh, for our predicament. If I said progress was a set of blinders, that the expectations, the narratives of progress are a set of blinders that allow, that disallow us from seeing everything that's going on, that wood-wide web of fungal connections across trees supporting so many kinds of life and dipping into soils and bringing together atmospheric you know, the light from the sun, which is becoming sugars in the trees and then moving through the fungi into creating a whole world, uh, that that's a great image with, from which we could begin to talk about a different set of stories of what it means to survive despite the damaged world that we might have created. Yeah. 
Yeah, but then of course the Matsutake mushroom in particular, because what 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 amazed me was that um, you point out that these mushrooms were the first to sprout again after the detonation of the atomic bomb um, on Hiroshima, I think. So the first things lively that popped up after the end of the world. So is this, I don't know, is this then something particular to the Matsutake mushroom that it goes well with, I don't know, us people or us part of capitalists destroying the world where these mushrooms tend to th strive on and then, um, I don't know, how to how to take that? Because we tend to conceive of nature as, as good and ourselves as bad. So if nature does, does well on what we have done wrong, then <laughs> it's confusing. <laughs> well, let me introduce the matsutake mushroom. And we use that term matsutake for a range of different species, <clears throat> as biologists would recognize them. But what they have is a distinctive, strong smell uh, that is quite disturbing if you've never smelled it before, but is considered absolutely delicious by connoisseurs in uh, Japan and Korea. Uh, a California mushroom uh, lover who does not like the matsutake uh, described the smell of matsutake as a juxtaposition between red hots and dirty socks. Red Hots are a cinnamon, a spicy cinnamon candy. And if you can imagine dirty socks and Red Hots somehow mixed up to each other, it's a disturbing smell. But I, and when I first smelled it, I thought, can I really eat this? And then after a Japanese friend prepared some for me, I came to think of it as the most de delicious smell I could imagine. And I've talked to a high end grocer in Kyoto, in Japan, who said, you know, people come into my store without the money to buy this extremely expensive mushroom, but they come in just to enjoy the smell because the smell makes people really happy. So uh, this is a gourmet mushroom. And because uh, it has good prices uh, and for reasons I'll get into in a minute, it became rather rare uh, starting in the late 1970s in uh, Japan. Uh, people search for this mushroom around the world in uh, temperate forests, particularly places under pine trees, uh, and uh, they're shipped um, uh, mainly to Japan, but also used in Japanese restaurants, for example, in Europe and North America. In, uh, in Japan, uh, this mushroom accompanies the pine trees that grow in human disturbed uh, woodlands, peasant woodlands, uh, that when people use the woods for charcoal making, they rake the fallen leaves uh, for a kind of green manure for the fields, they create a particular kind of disturbed woodland. And um, Matsutake grow in that woodland together with the pines. Now, it's important to point out that not all human disturbance is the same, that these aren't parking lots uh, or, uh, you know, other kinds of, of human disturbances that would just be impossible. Where If you can't grow a pine tree, you can't grow a Matsutake. But it does mean that certain kinds of human disturbance actually help the matsutake grow in part because matsutake is a bad competitor with some of the mushrooms that would grow if you had a nice fertile rich patch. So matsutake is good in places where there's eroded and kind of mineral soils. One of those places happens to be central Oregon in the US Pacific Northwest. It used to be a place of very grand ponderosa pine trees, it became a center point for logging back in the 1930s through the 1950s. They got rid of all these majestic, beautiful ponderosa pines. This kind of weedy looking pine grows up called lodgepole pine. Instead, um, in Europe, it's often called contorta pine. Uh, and uh, it, it's much smaller. Like if you think of it as a lodgepole, that's the pole that you would use for a kind of constructing some kind of, uh, uh, but it's not, it's not a majestic in the way that the ponderosas were. 
Um, and then the Forest Service uh, stopped um, burning, disallowed burning for many years, which turned out to be a bad idea. But at the time, they thought it was going to help the, lump, the timber companies. And in that strange anthropogenic situation of lack of burns, getting rid of the ponderosas, allowing these lodge poles to grow up, Matsutake flourished. So it was a human disturbed space. Again, not a parking lot, but a particular kind of human disturbance that allowed these weedy pines and this fungus that uh, does well in minerally uh, eroded and disturbed soils. So uh, these things came together at this moment uh, for the last 30 years or so in Oregon to make this a hot spot for um, matsutake mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. And what I think um, it would be interesting to discuss now the ways in which you um, show that um, so the global supply chain that the Matsutaka also becomes part of, so there are certain supply chains that the Matsutaka is part of, um, that we should be very um, hesitant in arguing that, I don't know, a global supply chain in itself is a bad thing. Or, um, as you um, argue also, you uh, introduced um, the notion of, of scalability. Um, so the idea that capitalism is um, characterized by wanting to scale up in a way so that it can expand, but to scale up you have to um, make things more abstract in a way, um, alienate them, you can make them exchangeable this way, that way, etc., etc. So then, at first, I thought scalability is always a bad idea. We should, I don't know, we should not um, strive for scalability, local or small, that's a good thing. But then, you're right, um, it would be a huge mistake to assume that uh, non-scalability is, uh, is good and scalability is bad. Uh, Non-scalable projects can be as terrible in their effects as scalable ones. And then, as an example, you, you mention uh, unregulated logging, although, yeah, so I'm not really sure uh, how that relates to the Matsutake specifically, but so you point out that we should always be aware of the fact that, um, yeah, in, in what situations is something good, good or bad? Um, so, but how does this relate then to our thinking about um, capitalism in general. So would you argue that uh, also when we think about capitalism, we should not, we should salvage certain parts of capitalism and not say this hasn't brought us anything, we should do away with it and all that comes with it, the scalability, the supply chains, everything. Well, I, I see you sort of pushing on the, the nuances here, but maybe I should say, you know, this Zoom technology that I'm speaking to you from uh, is only possible because of kind of the, the heights of scalable uh, kinds of rationalization, that everything about our electronic industry depends on, you know, the image that you're seeing of me right now is divided into scalable pixels. And the only way it's possible is through that technology of scalability. And I, as I said before, think that, you know, this incessant travel isn't always the best idea. So I'm actually grateful uh, for the Zoom technology that we're meeting on right now. On the other hand, I do want to say that the attempts to rationalize nature for the maximization of profit have generally been so destructive that I, I don't know if I could be stronger in trying to condemn it. That just two days ago, I went to a seminar on a new book that's coming out by Tanya Lee and Pujo Samedi called Plantation Life, and it's about the uh, oil palm plantations in Indonesia, which if you just look online and look for uh, images, they go for miles and miles as far as the eye can see without a break. They have transformed what used to be a very rich tropical forest with people in it. So not an empty space, but a forest with uh, farms and people 
uh, into a single monocrop without a hedgerow, without a break of any sort. This is terrifyingly destructive to both humans and non-humans. They have managed to destroy almost all uh, animals except for rats in this uh, kind of way, in what was one of the biodiversity hotspots of the world. Uh, and, you know, even just by refusing hedgerows, they have made it impossible for animals, plants, fungi to find any refuge spots. So I can't think of anything more terrifying than the forms of scalability that we have introduced to convert land into just a source for a single kinds of crops. Uh, it's also brought an enormous number of pests and pathogens around the world that threaten not just the plants on the plantation, but the whole surrounding ecosystems. So I can't think of anything more terrifying than that. And that the difference between an oil palm plantation and uh, the kinds of woods that through in which Matsutake mushrooms are found couldn't be stronger. So while I'm unwilling to condemn all features of scalability, I do think the, the attempt to turn uh, land around the world into monocrop plantations is one of the scariest things for life on Earth that's happening right now. Yeah, um, um, but, but isn't um, the distinguishing factor then um, th so the importance of livelihood that you also stress. So then livelihood in the broadest sense for both people, uh, yeah, so both humans and non-humans alike. So as long as there's room for, for, for livelihoods, there's precarious livelihood, but it's livelihood then, um, then you're in the, yeah, you're okay, you're in the clear. <laughs> um. Well, I, you know, it, first about the livelihood thing, I think, in the mid 20th century and all the way through the end of the 20th century, it was both common sense and scholarly biology that every species was in there for itself, that humans just needed to think about other humans and the rest of them, well, they could just be our tools and if they weren't useful, well, exterminate them. Now, nobody thinks that anymore as a scholar and common sense is going to come around, I hope which is that, you know, we cannot live without other species. It's just not possible. We can't digest our food without bacteria. Uh, so many of the cells in our bodies are bacterial cells that we need. And if we try and kill them all off, uh, we're in huge trouble. We need plants because we wouldn't get any oxygen without them. You know, that we are part of a web of multi-species relationships in which our survival, so that to imagine that there could be a human livelihood that did not include other uh, species livelihoods also, turns out just to be one of the great uh, wrong ideas of the 20th century. So that's got to be the starting place, it seems to me, is that we need, um, we need to imagine the planet as a place for more than human livelihoods, including, you know, fungi, as well as plants and animals and all kinds of forms of life that we're just not going to get anywhere yeah. uh, imagining that humans are there for themselves and that we can convert everything into a resource or form of food uh, to increase human populations. It's just not going to work out. Yeah. Then I'm wondering though, yeah, so probably this is what has gotten us into what's now been called the sixth mass extinction. Um, there's currently a summit going on in Glasgow. Are you... I don't know, are they taking these kinds of insights into account there? Are you hopeful that um, there will be focus on, on the livelihoods of ours as part of the livelihoods of others? Well, for those who don't know about the sixth mass extinction, the point is that what humans are up to on Earth has caused the most rapid extinction event 
uh, in the history of the world that there have been other extinction events. But this one, just over 200 years, we are seeing huge numbers of species disappearing. And, it, you know, and a lot of them for completely idiotic reasons that because humans have been transferring amphibians like um, bullfrogs and, you know, as pets, as uh, little development projects, as all kinds of tiny reasons. But that trade has spread a disease uh, to wild frogs and salamanders all around the world that's killing off frogs and salamanders like crazy. So it's... Um, It's a terrifying thing, you know, to imagine that our grandchildren might never see a frog. Um, what it will take is uh, refusing to allow the idea that business as usual is always good. And, you know, that it goes, takes us back to where we were, that as we open up from the pandemic, will we allow uh, the all the kinds of common sense in the terrible sense, uh, business practices to go on completely unregulated, completely regarded as a necessity of human life. Uh, because then we don't have a chance uh, that it is those practices, those everyday business practices that are converting to the world into a place that's unlivable by all the kinds of plants and animals that don't want to collaborate. I mean, like the rats on the oil palm plantations, rats are doing just fine. If we want to live with just rats, we're building the right <laughs> world. <laughs> but if we care about anything else, we can't do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to thank you also for, I, I feel like you, you share your sadness about what's going on as well, right? Yeah, thank you for that's that. Right. I think that's very important. Aside from anger now and again, we need, we need the room for sadness. Um, uh, and because I'm taken over a bit by it, but also because I want to allow you um, to ask a question or perhaps share something. Um, so I turn, to, um, I turn to you, there's a microphone if you want to um, share something, please raise your hand. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you for um, Anat Singh for being here with us. Um, I read your book. It was really uh, it opened my eyes, and I think thinking along with complexity and using it as a tool to understand our world is a, a very valuable tool. And it can also be very much used for critiquing the way we are doing right now. But I'm wondering uh, to move away from anger and sadness to hopefulness and maybe a potential to do something. In which ways do you see this complexity that can be used to build something and to provide us with a new design for the world we want to live in tomorrow? Thank you for that question. Uh, and I think one of the big lessons I learned from working with mushrooms was the importance of patchiness in the American uh, forestry establishment had tried to study mushrooms with transects, that is, lines uh, run through the forest that are good for studying something as big as trees, but they turn out to be completely useless for studying mushrooms. If you want to study mushrooms, you have to think of the patch structure of fungi. That lesson has, has uh, held over to me to understanding the Anthropocene, that is, this time of environmental problems, that I believe we need to study it through patches. That is the ecological scenes through which particular uh, terrible things are happening. That I mentioned the amphibian trade, which is creating a particular structure of frog disappearance around the world. That the first thing that comes to my mind is let's focus on the patches where things are happening and work on them. So perhaps that kind of unregulated sending of American bullfrogs or 
African clawed toads, these are species that don't die from this amphibian disease. So they spread the disease. And those American bullfrogs go across the countryside in Latin America where they were sent and kill off other frogs, both through disease and through eating them. So maybe this sending of American bullfrogs across the world is not a good idea. But you see what I'm trying to do is address some of the particular patches that are the problem. And I think that's the beginning of the answer. I'm not against worldwide mobilizations. That's fantastic. Go for it. But at the same time, many of these problems, like the uh, you know the extermination of frogs through the spread of this disease through commercial uh, global uh, uh, transport of frogs, that that probably won't get addressed in the climate change legislation. So let's also deal with the problems in the patches where uh, they occur. And um, I'll just make a call out to my digital project, Feral Atlas, which you can find online, open access, which tries to show you what some of those patches are and in the process also how we might deal with some of them. It does have an article on the global amphibian trade. But I'm wondering then, so, isn't this what you call this? This is why you think it's so important that we practice in the arts of noticing. So, is this something that we should learn to notice, but then perhaps um, differently around the globe? So, what uh, what is important for me to learn to notice here is not what's important to learn to notice elsewhere. So, there's no scalability in the arts of noticing. Is that um, yeah? But then I'm, I am wondering though, but. <laughs> How can you can you teach us in the art of noticing, or should we teach ourselves? But then how? I guess yes. I think uh, we all should be learning, and of course, uh, each of us comes more easily to some kinds of noticing than others. But that's where we learn from others. What the Feral Atlas Project, which is a big collaborative project uh, that you can find online tries to do is to look at some of the different ways that arts of noticing uh, can be practiced, that we have natural scientists, we have uh, indigenous elders, we have humanist poets, uh, social scientists, historians, all showing us through particular ecological patches that they have observed or done research on, they show us how is it that you might practice these arts of noticing to look at a particular ecological patch and what's going on there for better or for worse? No. Um, I think we have time for one final very short question. Yeah? Who would like to have the honor? Yes. Yeah, so please, um, if you could please keep it short. Thank you. Well, actually, it's a question which looks a little bit as my <laughs> previous one, uh, because I'm very interested in biomimicry and uh, I'm interested in communication. So can we learn something from the fungi uh, in terms of are there operating principles, are there lessons learned, are there analogies we can use in social innovation or in other area in our society from the fungi world? <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you very much for that. And indeed, I think uh, some of the things that we can learn from fungi I've mentioned, such as the, uh, the, the thing about fungi, it obviously never occurred to them that they live by themselves, that these mycorrhizal fungi that I've been trying to describe, which are uh, already create co-species kinds of arrangements, uh, that this generosity to uh, make um, nutrients available for all kinds of life, that the very first lesson that I would learn from fungi is uh, to move beyond the idea that every species is out there for itself. Yeah, so um, so they're generous. They 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 give us things to, to eat instead of um, eating the planet like um, uh, we do in some of our practices. Yeah. So, so, actually, let me add a coda to that. So I was talking about mycorrhizal fungi. Pathogenic fungi 
are some of the most terrible diseases on earth. <laughs> that those amphib amphibians that I was talking about, the frogs are dying because of fungal disease. So as collaborators in the Anthropocene, in the worst sense of collaborators, deadly collaborators, uh, they can be some of the most powerful forces of extermination that are out there on the planet. So also beware. <laughs> well, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for being here with us, um, this interview, um, and uh, sharing this uh, story about the matsutake and other fungi and mushrooms. Um, and um, thank you all for being here. I hope you enjoy the rest of the Brainwash Festival. Yeah. Thank you.